Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, come on down and join us. You can look us up at ccinland.org. The CC stands for Calvary Chapel. So really easy, ccinland.org. And you can find out our address. You can look up past uh, Facebook live devos and other things that are there so today we are in the book of second corinthians so if you want to grab your bible a cup of coffee and highlighter and a pen do so let's go ahead and pray <laughs> gracious father we thank you lord for just such a beautiful day and we know that rain is coming uh, i believe tomorrow we're praying that it just pours lord but then it stops Father, because we do have an event this coming Saturday, and we're praying, Lord, that you'd have grace upon the event, that it would just be a beautiful day, and we will be able to, to enjoy these, this event, and that you'll make this event prosperous, Father. It would just be a reflection of your glory, Lord. We pray that you minister to us now, Father, as the Apostle Paul uh, deals with some situations here within the Corinthian church, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Dina. Good morning, Patty. Glad you could join us this morning. Hopefully it's not too early for you. Okay, so we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, let me just give you a little hint as we um, read God's Word. And this is important for us, uh, especially for those that, that enjoy reading His Word on a daily basis. There is a, a um, general way of approaching God's Word uh, as you read it, uh, you have to look at first, there's, th there's three things. And the first one is, is that you always look at the problem. What's going on? What is taking place? What is Paul dealing with? What is Peter dealing with? What is James dealing with? Uh, what kind of people are they? You know, you just look at the problem. That's the first thing you do. What is the problem there? Uh, the second thing, the second thing that you do is, is that, it's not. It's worse than you thought. You think of it as it's worse than that. Not just for them, but for yourself. You know, how bad is it? Because it is pretty bad out there. Um, and then the third thing is, there's hope in Jesus. The answer is in Jesus Christ. So if you, you keep your thoughts on those three points as you're reading the scriptures, look what's going on. How, uh, how are they reacting to Paul and Paul dealing with this? And then ask yourself, how bad is it? It's pretty bad because that shouldn't be happening. And then what's the answer? Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of looking at it. So let's see what's going on here in chapter 11. It says, Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. So apparently, Paul is about ready to say some things, and he's a little, I, don't, I wouldn't say embarrassed, because he's a bold guy, but I would say that he's more cautious in how he's going to say it. And so um, he's sad that he has to say it, you know, kind of in a sense, that he even has to bring it up. You know, it's something that he probably shouldn't have to bring up. They should have probably understood and um, remedied it themselves, you know, took care of it themselves, but he has to bring it up. And so he's going to, you know, approach it as, as, as gently as possible. And so he kind of forewarns them, just, you know, understand what I'm about to say. It might be a little folly to you, but just bear with me. For I am zealous for you with godly zealous. So you see his love again. Uh, Paul loved the Corinthians. He loved all of the churches that were there uh, just as much as um, um, any other apostle would have. And of course, obviously, that love stems from Christ because Christ loves the church very deeply. It is his bride, and he's in love with his bride. For I have betrothed you to one husband. So... Uh, that husband is Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I was, in the sense, uh, the person that brought you a a as uh, a bride would come to the groom, to your husband. That I may present you as a chaste virgin uh, to Christ. So that speaks of him correcting them and them receiving the information so that they're pure before 
Jesus Christ. They're standing before him holy. They're standing before him with a clear conscience as they walk with the Lord. But I fear, at least somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted with the simplicity that is in Christ. So, uh, apparently, uh, Satan's involved in, in some of these mind-altering occasions that take place uh, within the church itself. And he's warning them about the craftiness of, of Satan and how he comes into uh, their minds. And then he goes on, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now, it's interesting because what he's saying is someone is preaching something different. Someone is coming to them with something that's not the same as what Paul has. And so he's saying, look, you can put up with it in the sense that don't receive it, don't participate, don't be a part of it. It's going to go on. It's going to happen. You're not going to be able to stop that. If this group is stopped, there'll be another group down the road. And by the way, isn't it interesting that these groups that Satan raises up to mimic Christianity uh, are so bold enough to be uh, named exactly as Paul said to beware of? You know, like another gospel of Jesus Christ. You know who uses that? The Mormons. The Mormons use that all the time. They have commercials that come on in the middle of the night and they'll say, we want to give you a free gift. It is another gospel of Jesus Christ. Come and know the real story. And if you have any questions, you can call us right now. We'll send you this, this free gospel of Jesus, another gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's funny that Paul says, don't receive someone that comes to you and says, I have another gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet the Mormons do that and people receive it. Now, why is that? Because they're not reading their Bible. <laughs> it's plain and simple. That's the answer is read your Bible. Most of our problems stem from the fact that we don't understand what's going on. We haven't dug into it and read the information. Do we really even know what Mormons believe? Most people say, but they're good people. They're really nice and they're friendly. Yeah, I don't argue that at all. And in fact, they give you food and clothing. Yeah, I don't argue that at all either. Uh, they're very family oriented. They have facilities. Um, they have <coughs> events and couples and various things like that that they draw you in with. And I don't argue that at all. Virginia and I, when I first got saved, she had a friend that was a Mormon. And we had already started hanging around them they invited us over to dinner uh, to join them in couples things. And they did some pretty fun games for couples and things like that. But they were Mormons. And I didn't realize it at the time. Virginia didn't realize it. But we were slowly being tugged in, you know, slowly drawing us into this. And then it was during a time when, when I had been radically saved. And so I started researching. I mean, I just got into the Bible, was reading the New Testament already, uh, listening to radio, Christian men, apologetics. Walter Martin, and so I learned what the Mormons believed. And so one day I just said, you guys believe that Jesus is a God. That's what you believe, that he's not God Almighty. And he goes, oh, yeah, we, we believe that. Well, that's an error. That's not according to the Bible. And you have another book, another gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we, and he tried to explain these things. And, and you also have the, 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 the Pearl of Great Price book that you go by, but you don't go by the Bible. And the Bible says this, you know, and that was the beginning of our departure from each other, you know, because I boldly preached the gospel to them. But the reason that people are sucked into that is because they're not reading their Bible. They're not searching out the truth. There is a truth, right? What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? He said, I am the truth. I am the way and I am the life. There is no other way to the Father except through me. That's pretty absolute. Yes. If you know that scripture in itself, then you understand that every other way is a lie. Every other way is false. It's misleading and it's drawing you away from the truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth. If you want truth, you get into my word 
You get into my scriptures that have been here for thousands of years, and even before that, through the, New, the Old Testament. In Genesis, the first prophecy was the, was the prophecy pertaining to Jesus coming and crushing the head of the enemy. So getting in the scriptures is so important. As a pastor, I see people drawn away so quickly and easily. I remember a, a precious sister who I had known and, and had ministered to, and, and she was involved in church and so forth, and all of a sudden she just disappeared. And one day I saw her at a yard sale, and I said, where have you been? She goes, oh, I've been going to the Mormon church. It is so nice over there. And I just about fell over. I'm like, wow, why would you do that? You know, and I tried to explain to her, and she, she wouldn't have it because it's so nice over there. Well, we replace truth with emotions and feelings and how nice it is, right? And that's ashamed. So Paul is saying, look, if someone comes to you with another gospel, do not receive them. You can put up with them, but don't receive them. For I consider I am not at all inferior to the, to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. I love that about Paul, and I love reading this part. And every time I read it, I go, thank you, Lord, because that's so encouraging, because I am untrained in speech, too. My language isn't always the best. I, I, I think I speak backwards sometimes. Or say, instead of having a sentence uh, in a proper order, sometimes I put it in a different order. But for some reason, people still understand, so that's kind of interesting. I think that's the Holy Spirit. But Paul says, look, I, I'm untrained. I'm not like an Apollo. I don't have this great, great language, but I do have the knowledge. I do understand the truth. And that's something that I know and I stick with and it has been manifested among you. Did I commit sin in abasing myself that you might be excelled because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I rob other churches taking wages for them to minister to you. So the Corinthian church, apparently he wasn't charging. He wasn't taking love offerings, wasn't taking any money from them to help him in his ministry. He was doing it free of charge. But then other churches he was taking. Now, now what's the standard there? Where did that principle come from? That's what we call leading of the Holy Spirit. Leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, do ministers get salaries? Yes, they do. They are to live off of the church. They are the priest of the Old Testament. Interesting because we're going to be looking at chapter 3 tonight in Numbers and the whole chapter deals with the priest. And now God is going to divide the Levi Le Levites into two groups. They're going to have the Levites who are the, who are the um, uh, caretakers of the temple. And then you're going to have the Levites who are the priests. And the Levites who are the caretakers are the ones that take care of the temple, take care of all the articles, takes care of the people, but they also take care of the priest. So they're freeing the priest up so they can do what he needs to do. And God raises up these Levites to maintain the temple so that he can free up the priest to do what he needs to do. So he raises them up to serve the priest, actually. And that's interesting because we kind of mimic that in the Calvary Chapel. God says that the pastor is to focus on what he needs to do. And that's in prayer, studying the word, teaching, you know, visiting people in the hospital, and counseling. Those are the things he should be doing. He shouldn't be doing all the other stuff. God raises up people to do all that other stuff. They should understand that they're freeing me up. And that's a privilege, just as the priest uh, at that time were privileged to have people to free them up to do the things that they needed to do. And in fact, when you really look at it, the priests were in a very dangerous place because they had to actually go into the Holy of Holies at times. In any moment, God could have consumed them. At least, they, at least the people didn't have to go in. You know, they could just maintain everything, clean it up, you know, whatever, and so forth, and not have to be confronted with God Almighty you know, and, and the requirements. So. But yeah, Paul is saying here, look, uh, some churches we charge, but we haven't charged you at all. He says, I robbed other churches taking wages from them so I could minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was burdened to no one. But what was lacking to me, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting 
in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows, but that I do. I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Again, the Mormon church, that's what they do. You know, the Mormon church has apostles and their leader is an apostle. They consider him a voice of God. And at any point, he can actually change the rules if he wants to because he's an apostle of God. And so he says, these are false apostles. They're false apostles. <clears throat> They're deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles. Um, I'm going to get into touchy, touchy ground here. How bad is it? Right? How bad is it? It's pretty bad because today... Uh, you will have pastors who aren't content with just being called pastors. And in fact, some pastors will get offended if you don't call them pastor. If you call them by their name, they'll go, no, wait a minute, my I, title's pastor, so-and-so, you know. But that's not enough because now they want to be called bishop, so-and-so, you know. And there are those churches. How bad is it? Well, sometimes they even want to be called most reverend so-and-so. You know, and these are pe men in churches that are for titles. And that's what Paul is saying. That's how bad it is. Because they want titles. They want people to respect them. Uh, they want to have that authority. And then they use that authority. It doesn't bother me uh, if people just say, hey, Reuben. I'm like, yeah, what do you, what do you need? You know, that's fine because that's my name is Reuben. You know, if you don't want to call me pastor, that's, that's fine with me. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm not your pastor. That's all. You know, you haven't felt comfortable enough to say that you're my pastor. Maybe I haven't met a need. Maybe I haven't done this or that. Or maybe you're just waiting to see. Who knows? Um, but I think that there are people, though, that call me pastor that don't understand what they're really saying. Because they may be saying, Pastor Reuben, but uh, you have no authority over me. You can't tell me what to do. Don't correct me. Don't lead me. Don't guide me, you know, uh, within this church. And so they have it totally the opposite, you know, instead of truly understanding what the word pastor means. It's an under-shepherd. And you're respecting the fact that God has put someone in place of a pastor to run a ministry. And you're respecting that. And you are abiding by the guidelines that have been set by the leadership and so forth. So there's a way there. But when you go beyond that into an extreme of most reverend, pastor so-and-so or if you go the other way where we're not going to call you pastor at all so you got to have that that uh, that balance right they're false verse 14 and no wonder for satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light uh another interesting group is the jehovah witnesses right jehovah witnesses believe that jesus is a is michael the archangel and, and here Paul is saying, look, at Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And Jehovah Witnesses will say that Jesus is an archangel. You know, the Mormons, the Mormons, uh, the Mormons also said that they got their plates, their writings, the Book of Mormon from an angel of light. <clears throat> so we see where that writing came from, Satan himself. So interesting. Therefore, <coughs> and you notice too, the New Testament was written, what, over, over 2,000 years ago? The Book of Mormon was written in the 1800s, late 1800s. So what about all the people before the Book of Mormons and the Mormon Church came along? What happened to them? You think that's fair of God to leave a billions of people hanging without truth? No, the truth was right here in the scriptures. It doesn't make any logical sense. At all. So, he goes on. Therefore, it is no great thing if this ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their own works. So if Satan does it, so will ministers do it too. I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly 
in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. <clears throat> so Paul's kind of having this, this, this thought here. Look, I don't know if this is the Lord or not, and I'm going to boast in my weakness, but I'm going to say it anyway. <clears throat> it may not be the Lord, but this is what I'm going to say. So in himself, his own flesh, he's having a struggle of whether this is really what God's telling him to say or not. Now, is it what God's telling him to say? I believe it is because it's in the scriptures and the scriptures are inspired of God. So yeah, God wanted him to say those things very clearly. <clears throat> Verse 19, for you put up with fools gladly since you yourselves are wise. And that's kind of sarcastic talking, right? <laughs> since you guys are so wise and you choose these these angels of lights, you know, and you choose these men that are crafty minded and so forth, you know, obviously you're wise, uh, very wise for you put up with it. If one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face, our shame, I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Isn't it interesting that people can follow people and they're taking advantage of them? You know, I knew a precious lady who was coming here to the church for quite a while uh, because of her son. And she had been following this guy that was here in Garden Grove, I believe. And then all of a sudden he got a word from the Lord, we're moving to Texas and the whole church needs to move. They need to sell your houses, everything you have, you need to move with me to, to, to Texas. You know, and It was one of these faith movements. You gotta have faith, you gotta trust in God and when you do, God's gonna bless you. And we kept trying to talk her out of it, give her scriptures, this is false, you can't just, you know, and it's just one of these persons that are gonna put you in bondage, devour you or take from you something. And they took everything from him everything and then eventually about a year later they ended up coming back to California because they lost everything you know and this person of course takes all that and they store it in their little bank accounts you know and they find the next group to do the same thing and that's how they live through deception you know Paul says no we're not we're not that smart we don't we don't do that and I you know God forbid that we do that I don't ever want to do that at all if anything we should always err on the side of serving instead of taking. It's hard for me to take. I don't want to take from someone. I want to give. Now, there are people that want to give. And I'm not going to take that away from them either. Because if they want to give, then I'm going to take that. Because God will bless them for that. But I am not going to go taking it from them. It's They have to give. He goes on, for our shame, I say that we also we were too weak in that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labor, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In, in prisons, more frequently. In death, often. From the Jews, five times, I receive 40 stripes minus one. Now, Paul is basically not boasting here, but again, just sharing truth. These men are coming in and they're telling you all these great things about themselves. Well, let me tell you about me. Because if they're saying they're just some great Hebrew Jewish ancestry, well, I've got one too. If they're saying that, you know, this or that, I got one too. And in fact, if they're saying they've been beaten, well, I'll tell you what. Jews themselves beat me 40 minus one. That means 39 stripes. I'll show you my back if you want to see it. So don't tell me that these guys are anything because I've been through it. Three times I was beaten with rods, once with, with stone. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in deep, in journeys often, in pearls of water. Pearls, is that pearls? Not pearls, perils, perils of water. <gasps> in perils of robbery, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea. Boy, poor Paul, I'm starting to feel bad for him. <laughs> perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleepless 
in sleeplessness often, in hunger, in thirst, in fasting often, in cold, in nakedness, besides uh, the other things, uh, what comes upon me daily, my deep concerns for all the churches. And then he's got his own little worries about the churches. Our lives don't look so bad after all now, huh? I mean, we could probably go, okay, so uh, my washer machine broke down. All right. Uh, someone said something negative against me. All right. Have you ever been beaten with stripes? No, I haven't ever been beaten with stripes. Have you ever died? No. Have you been shipwrecked? No, I haven't. Been. Paul went through it all, right? Man, amazing. Amazing. And then he still had the worries of the churches. So he goes on, who is weak? Am I, am I am not weak? Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. You would think he would be angry over all of those things, but he's saying, no, my heart doesn't burn with, with anger at all. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmities or weaknesses. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under uh, Artis, the king, was guarding the city of the, of the Damascenes uh, with the garrison desiring to uh, apprehend me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. That's the ministry. Being in a basket and escaping <laughs> from danger. So Paul, Paul had a very interesting life, a very hard life, a life that was filled with death and life situations that none of us have even come close to. You know, I would even suggest and say that his life was even worse than Jesus as well. It was here on this earth, right? Up to the cross, I'm saying. Yeah. Jesus never suffered a, a shipwreck. He was never beaten up to the cross to death. You know, he didn't go through some of the things that, that Paul did. But at the cross, of course, ultimately you can never compare the weight of the world upon your shoulders. Christ did the most suffering of all mankind. But even Christ had stripes upon his back of condemnation. Forty of, was of condemnation, right? Thir one less means that you're not condemned. So Paul had 39 stripes. So he could truly understand what humans were going through. We should be encouraged. So what's our answer? How did Paul get through all of those things? Christ. He kept his mind on Christ. He put his faith in Christ. He never let go of Christ. He looked at the bigger picture, his eternal security. That is the answer is Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your precious word. And I pray it's, that it was encouraging for some today who are going through things, Lord. I pray for uh, my sister, Lord, who, who is a single parent mother with a child who's working, trying to make ends meet, and yet does not have enough to survive, Lord. I lift them up to you, Lord, and I pray that they find confidence and peace and rest and provisions in Christ, Lord, above all things, Lord, as they've been on my heart, Lord God. And may you help us, Lord, in our small little situations to find peace and rest in Christ, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for 